So in organizing today's events, um, we had been thinking about um, inserting a second keynote at this point and thought better of it um, because we felt that it would be important to bring into the context of the symposium uh, some speakers who are uh, working directly on projects that are taking place in Detroit um, so that we could insert that activity into the day's um, proceedings. Uh, we are going to have um, four speakers. I'll introduce them in a moment. Um, and then um, there won't be a panel discussion immediately following their presentations. Um, instead, if you have questions of them and, or of what they're showing, um, we can take those questions and discuss their work as part of our wrap-up because I think that would be highly appropriate um, to bring that conversation in as we finish our day's proceedings. So, um, you know, as we've been discussing uh, over the course of the morning, Detroit is seeing an increase in population for the first time in decades when the, within the context of housing and infrastructure that has deteriorated significantly over the same period. The practitioners and developers presenting during what I've called our Detroit interlude uh, will discuss medium density projects on the boards and in construction that are part of the city's post-recession revitalization and to a certain extent as well how it is that that work is being accomplished. Um, so we have, as I said, four speakers. Um, And this is what you will learn from these four speakers. Four speakers, Abir Ali, who is an independent consultant on socially conscious city building in the city of Detroit. Antonio Fiel, Antonio Fiel Silva, who's the founding principal at Sitio Architects and Urbanism in Philadelphia. Elizabeth Whitaker, founder and principal of Merge Architects in Boston and Lars Grebner, uh, owner and principal at Volume One here in uh, Detroit with Christina Hansen, who is also part of that team. Um, and he is an assistant professor of practice at Talman College. Uh, so with that, I will bring up a beer. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, happy to be here. So uh, my title says independent consultant, but quite honestly, I'm on a, a self-induced sabbatical that isn't going entirely well. Um, so I'm very happy to be here to share some of those thoughts. Uh, so in the last eight years in Detroit, I'm a Detroiter born and raised, came back and have been practicing in the space of the built environment for uh, a little bit over eight years. And in that time, I've been able to move across various disciplines that are intrinsic to city building. And I think this is important because it sets up some of the ways that I think through development, which is the last industry that I really came out of. So from architecture to philanthropy to economic development and real estate development, from a spectrum of affordable housing to market rate mixed use, that's been the kind of language that's been in my brain for quite a while. And so as I've moved through this place-based work in Detroit, um, I've been very aware that all of these intersect, that they're highly, highly um, related to each other. And in the last three years in particular, um, after working with developers in my past in some capacity, either as clients or subsidizing development, three years ago I moved into a role that I was working directly in development. And so um, it was, it's a role that really looked at how we married the qualitative to the quantitative. So who is stewarding that kind of qualitative lens on the pro forma? And so what this translates to is really stewarding design, programming, partnerships, and art initiatives. Uh, and I've been out of this role now for about two months, and in those two months, um, I've had a little bit of time to reflect. Uh, so bear with me because you're looking at a prototype of my thoughts a little bit. So 440, 400. 
units of housing across nearly two dozen sites and eight neighborhoods in Detroit from west side to east side. So those are projects that are very small that are embedded in neighborhoods and those can be projects that are um, quite large, mixed use, important housing components, but from single digits to several hundred. And so the goal of these projects, regardless of their size, whether they were small or large, um, really involved keeping people who live here living here, encouraging people who work here to live here, and in this mixed use model really looking at housing that meets the city's affordability requirement of 20% of units at 80% AMI, but given affordability being so relative, um, really trying to go above and beyond um, that requirement whenever possible because the reality is that 80% AMI is $69,000 a year, and in Detroit, AMI is $26,000 a year. So that's a pretty large gap. But the goal is try to get that all to marry. So it always starts somewhere. Um, you're going you're gonna to see a conversation that's constantly in my brain as I think of these projects from four to 400 that I've worked on in the last several years. Um, so it always starts somewhere. And there's this feeling that I think the pro forma will work. That's a good place to start. Um, and every project, again, regardless of the number of units, uh, the neighborhoods, the budgets, whether it's two and a half million to 50 million, um, really this is a slice of conversation that has permeated through. So mixed income housing and neighborhood retail, this is the dream. We're gonna do something incredible with getting as many um, income brackets and housing as we possibly can while balancing the pro forma and we're gonna go after neighborhood retail because you want a vibrancy to your streetscape, you want an authenticity, you want familiarity. So there's this pursuit of that perfect mix of um, housing and neighborhood coming together. And so, and really getting more towards the reality of actually actual de embracing actual Detroiters in this, um, in this formula. We want the best architect. We should always want the best architect, um, but often not at that fee. Um, some of my panelists, I have been advocating, but it's always not at that fee. Um, and with design time halved, which is real because uh, we wanna get in the ground to start generating revenue as soon as we possibly can. But the reality is that development is probably the fastest moving and slowest moving industry you will sit through. Um, can this be financed? And that will come up over and over again. So between residential and retail and parking and creative programming, is it a project that can actually be financed properly? And as we're figuring all of that out, we can't talk to the community yet. We get far along and construction costs are debilitating because this is very real. Rising construction costs, a shortage of labor, you will hear this over and over again. This is all across the country, particularly in Detroit. Um, Back to the financing. So again, delicate puzzle, it weaves in and out. Every project requires subsidy, every project is competing for the same dollars, so um, it's very real. That rent number can't be supported, you have to look at your market, we need to shift our approach. Okay, we're ready to now talk to the community, but surprise, they already knew something was up, so they've been waiting for you to talk to them. Um, oh, now this pro forma might work. Again, it's a puzzle, so you have to adjust and be fluid. We need to adjust. Why are there additional design fees? Uh, all the architects know why there are additional design fees, because <laughs> you're adjusting. <laughs> We need to check in with the community uh, because they haven't heard from us in a very long while, but surprise, nothing has really changed on the project. <laughs> uh, value engineer again, and this will happen again and again, and maybe through a handful of contractors. Uh, and the financing again, and the story goes on and on. So this is just a slice, but you hope that you can get as close to closing and a real project with the same intention you started with, uh, with providing solid housing, getting it built, and making your investors happy. So those types of conversations have played in my mind for, um, for a while now, and as they have been, I've been reflecting on this, and I really kind of formulated an ongoing list of aspirations and practice. And so um, there are a lot of these, 
but today I've narrowed it down to 10 to test out. Uh, one, commit to a value system and don't compromise on vision. So this may seem very straightforward, but it's actually not because you get lost in projects all the time. And the most successful projects in Detroit that I've seen during my tenure in development have been the ones that really, really stick to a vision or a value system. Um, this is an image of the affordable housing entrance off an alley. So, you know, you need a value system. Uh, check yourself. Developments do not make community. People do. I think this is pretty simple, but, you know, I think it has to do with words. Um, and there's a certain sensitivity to words. So this is something that I've put myself in check in and I think is an important reminder. Uh, number three, pre prepare for it needing more work than anticipated always. So this is an obvious existing structure in Detroit. And what you'll know as a baseline is structures in Detroit suffer from years of neglect, vacancy, um, deferred maintenance, so they need a lot of love, and that's very real, and that's something that needs to be baked in up front. Um, and this is twofold. It's not just the built environment, but if we go back to the equation where we're talking about neighborhood retail and vibrancy that's really homegrown and authentic, then you're actually also looking that for that same amount of work and patience when it really comes to lifting up that kind of neighborhood retail. So, in Detroit, small businesses have survived with very um, limited access to capital, capacity, awareness. So this really, this thought extends beyond just physical space. Uh, question, vacancy, it was never a blank slate. It's very rude. Um, and I don't hear it so much anymore, but it's around every now and then. Every site has a history, it's super simple. Uh, connect to public space, be grateful for such a gift. So, given the reality of maximizing space that generates revenue, if you're dealing with a site that is adjacent to public space, embrace it. It is a gift. Piggyback off of it. Six, avoid making public art an afterthought. So, there is no requirement of developers to include public art into their performance. So, what happens is you go to that line item and it says zero dollars, or it might say $1,000, and neither is helpful. Um, and so I think this is a really important note, particularly because it becomes a way to really engage and empower people. So this is an image of recent college for creative grads with um, high school students down the street that were doing their practical experience, and they worked together to do something beautiful in a building. Treat a project like inheritance. When, when you're gone, the city gets it. So this is maybe not fair because it's an image of the Fisher Building and we're talking about housing and it's a completely different area, era, but no doubt it's an inspirational space. And the, the one thing that I always go back to is there was a time, and there should still be a time, where people think about what they're building beyond the developer's exit strategy. Invest with patience in pursuit of thoughtful transformation. So if you really want to do something impactful, it's going to require a lot of patience. Nine, create spaces that welcome the unexpected. So um, it's surprising if you break the equation and take a little risk at times, magic can happen. This was an image of an emerging creative studio that was mixed in with uh, a traditional office tenants. And um, it's pretty incredible what can happen when you just think a little bit beyond the typical um, tenant. And then the last one, which should be a 10, uh, create a place where people now can see themselves later. And that's as simple as it is. Those are my 10 thoughts. <laughs> Um, good afternoon. It's, I hope everybody loaded up on coffee. Uh, I have to confess that uh, I was giving the presentation. I said I'll, I'll breeze through it because it, we're treating it as a case study. And I was just stunned when I heard that there wasn't going to be a panel and Maurice couldn't uh, inimitably be really articulate and save me from myself. But I'll try now. <laughs> All right. 
Um, so the project that, um, again, we're going to be going through, actually we thought initially that we're going to be showing two projects. Uh, I am only can show one project and I felt like a beer just put me on the therapist's couch <laughs> about, about that. But um, the project that, uh, one of the projects, you know, which is uh, the Detroit Interlude, is uh, a project called La Jolla Gardens, which is the name that the community gave the project. And it's uh, just really treating this as a, as a case study. Um, it's a project that is uh, happening in um, underway and being worked on uh, in terms of its development process uh, over in the Hubbard Werner uh, corridor. Uh, it's a 53-unit project where uh, it's about 60, uh, two uh, two thirds of it is uh, affordable housing. You know, uh, 40 to 60 AMI, and the rest is uh, market rate housing. So it's important to actually mix and create a mixed neighborhood. Um, it's at 65, just the stats, 65 dwelling units per an acre. It's about a $12 million project. Uh, and in, in construction costs in Detroit have been really spiking uh, very drastically in the last uh, year. But uh, at last check, it was about $185 a square foot. And uh, the project really, most importantly, is intended to be a catalyst. Uh, I think it was Angie was saying that call all your projects demonstration projects. Was it Angie that said that? And I, I'm going <laughs> to use that. Right. I, I use that trick from now on because uh, def definitely it means that uh, it's ahead of a lot of things. And they always say that the pioneer is the guy with the arrows on his back, you know. Uh, and I think that um, in some cases, you know, we can feel this a lot. You know, we're trying to do new things. Um, uh, I think the project um, is. Um, actually, before we talk about the project, I wanted to talk about the challenges of doing projects. And I thought that we were seeing such incredibly inspirational and so thoughtful projects, you know, from, from Julie and, and, and everybody here and Elizabeth, and um, that, um, that I thought, well, you know, this is going to be like now uh, the reality of practice and what it takes to do something when the rover meets the road. So. Um, just very briefly, our firm is called Sitio, and Sitio is, uh, means site in Spanish, and we sort of were inspired to doing a firm so that uh, we uh, base our work and our architecture on the context. It's the, the physical context, but really the social context that brought it aboard, and also the, the economic context and all of the other things that, that make something happen. And the other side of, of, of context, uh, I have this quote by uh, the Spanish philosopher Ortega y Gasset, and it's like this is the good side of context that you want to embrace and channel and, and really sort of bring up. But there's the other side of context where you see situations like the homelessness and all the things that, that uh, Julie was mentioning that you have to change. And Garcegui said, says, I'm me and my circumstances. And if I don't change the circumstances, if I don't save the circumstances, then I won't save myself. So this project is a project that sort of exemplifies a little bit the, the, uh, the approach of our firm uh, it's a project that was developed by Jonathan Rose Companies in Philadelphia. I would often say that Philadelphia is like Detroit was maybe 10 years ago. We were part of the Rust Belt, uh, uh, the industrialized, a lot of empty lots, and, and the city was really looking to, to begin uh, repopulating empty areas. And uh, it's a project that um, uh, was, Jonathan wanted to create a model for projects that, if you know, uh, he did Via Verde that uh, Grimshaw Architects did for him in New York, which is an incredible project. Uh, it's, I forget how tall it is, 30, 40 stories tall, and a real model for green living in the city. But it was every, you know, he sort of got a little put off that everybody would say, oh, only New York. So he wanted to create a model for cities like uh, the Atlantas and the Detroits and the Philadelphias, you know, where you could actually say, where is that mid middle density uh, housing and how can it be made to work? And, and, and that sort of came out of the project. Uh, our approach to the project was really always designing things from the outside in and looking to really kill, one, uh, one, uh, kill many birds with the same stone. You know? And in this case, the diagram that we have here, it's a site that was actually, um, there's literally, oops, how do I go back? The pointer. Uh, there are the tracks, and there was the, the challenge side of the tracks, which is a Latino neighborhood, and then there was Temple University, and there's this really like this demilitarized line between them. So the project really was intended to create a whole series of connections and weaving through the neighborhood, a, a focus or hinge, and, and really beginning to integrate and modulate between the scales of the neighborhood and be a catalytic project. And, um, 
the challenging part of it was the context, you know, that, that you had to embrace and really bring, again, investment and in their sort of warehouses and townhouses, this is part of the new one, uh, but at the same time, uh, the context of building affordable housing in just such difficult circumstances. So if you looked, there was this one chart that I actually literally wanted to make a mural in the project, and it was a funding chart of 19 different funding sources and all of the channels that which that goes through. So literally, the project had more fees for lawyers than it did for all of the design and all the engineering. Um, in the end, the project, uh, uh, we really rolled with the punches. Uh, at some point, some of the bars went up and down according to what it was. It's, uh, part of it was uh, new market uh, tax credits you know, for the uh, uh, market part, and part of it was low-income uh, housing. And um, so it was, it was really quite challenging. Um, and, and in some ways, uh, it, it, that kind of, uh, a, a lot of the things that we're saying about always uh, having to do a lot with, with, with little and always getting thrown in the fray really uh, in a way characterizes a lot of the things that we do in this space. Uh, the context for the project was, is in, in the southwest area, also known as Mexican town part of it. This is the downtown area here. And if we uh, blow up this area, it's the Howard Farms Historic District, which is the yellow area, and also the, the uh, Werner kind of uh, corridor that ends in the Michigan Station, the Ford Innovation Center is right there. And the project area was right on that historic district zone here. Uh, the people that were sort of um, beginning to uh, in, reinvest in this area uh, is uh, Southwest, is, um, Invest Detroit, and, and again, Mauricio is going to jump in and correct me if I get anything wrong. It was uh, uh, working with Sinair, the affordable housing uh, developers, and the Southwest District to really create a catalytic component that begins to reinvest in the neighborhood. Um, uh, and this is the area for the project. So as we start looking at the project, uh, one of the things that has been almost a truism of our practice is, is uh, Thomas Jefferson would say that uh, design design action and political thinking are indivisible or otherwise that design is a political act. You know, either you accept the status quo and then that's really the status quo or you really try to challenge it. And in the end, the other thing that we found in these projects is that, that politics is the art of the possible, which is something that is said a lot in Washington. So here we had to really deal with the challenges of creating density in this uh, corridor that existed. Uh, where it had been really sort of eroded through time, through uh, uh, retail and parking and all these things. And in creating uh, that density, also really bringing uh, the whole point of that spear is parking. You know, they'll always use parking, the universal kind of point of the spear about, about uh, the fears of things that, you know, that says, oh, it's, a, it's an issue of that quantity. But, but hand in hand with that were other issues that we were dealing with because it was a historic district, is uh, historical. So we had to go through historical commission. Uh, and, and, uh, and the HDC, and then we also had to deal with the identity of the place, that you're bringing something that is alien because it's a different kind of density. Uh, it has some physical challenges, uh, but also it's really saying, well, uh, we're bringing something that's not like us. Is it modern? It's not like us. Uh, for who is it? Um, and then on top of that, you had to deal with the issue of affordable housing and the fact that there was a lot of... Uh, concern about the, both the two sides of, of affordable housing and doing new development and reinvesting. The stigma that it is like affordable housing and it's not of the quality, so they were very focused on quality. But then the other side of that is, okay, if you're reinvesting, then you're beginning to gentrify the neighborhood. So there's really a lot of concern there because of the, uh, the Ford uh, Innovation Center that, that happening. So uh, as we started doing the project, um, one of the things that, that we ended up doing is really just, I'm going to take you a little bit through the process, uh, beginning to see how we can unpack those challenges. And as part of the things that you always get thrown in, we started, um, we arrived, we looked at all those issues that were really important, we, we walked the site, we communed, we really started thinking, oh, we're going to have a deep thought process about this. And uh, we ended up going to the investor's office and they said, oh, we got to make the deadline for the uh, 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 tax credit application, which means that we can't submit that until we have the zoning and we don't have the zoning in place, so we need you to submit this in a week. <laughs> and we had just seen the site for the first time, so it was like we launched into the MacGyver, you know, boop, boop, you know, there's a danger, what do you do? And we had a whiteboard and I sort of came up with a plan that we promised them that in two days we would have completely drafted 
uh, and sent to the civil engineers so that they could create, create the documents that would go into planning. And all of our thoughts about uh, thoughtfulness that I see in these practices that make me ache, you know, um, and, and, and all of that sort of went by the window because you have to know what, what you know and then your instinct. But uh, so we did that and, and luckily that uh, didn't pan out, but we had to go through the whole process and, and burn some feet. But we did engage into a process of really looking really closely at the neighborhood. Uh, what you see here are photos of the different characteristics of the different textures of actual things in the neighborhood. It's a historic district, but yet it was as diverse as the population of the neighborhood itself. And even though it was considered Mexican town, we were also reminded by the African-American population and all the other people that were there that, that it really had to be inclusive for, for a lot of things. So one of the first things we did, we showed up and we didn't show any designs. And we created a way of creating some boards with voting buttons. You know, you had to start somewhere to begin to understand their aversions and their preferences for um, the things that they value in the neighborhood physically, but that would not push you towards an overt kind of historical reinterpretation of that. Then we went through a whole series of actually massing options, 15 out of the, I don't know, 40 we tried to come up with. And each one of them was sort of said, okay, this is a model for living that is a courtyard house. And the way you live here is more internalized and you're protected from the street, or this is a way that you actually start uh, facing the street and how you integrate it. And these are the voting numbers. And the community opted for really embracing the street. But even within that, there were various models of whether you have terrace gardens or smaller buildings or a central courtyard with a market. And then we also then were beginning to visualize uh, those typologies with what kind of a life can be led in those typologies. Um, and, and then, even as we looked at the spaces, we were not, quant we were not defining them in terms of uh, the architecture or a lot of the things, and, and we haven't even talked about density, but we're trying to say, look, let's think aspirationally of how this program relates to each other, very much programmatically along the ways of what Abir was mentioning. And, and again, very crude kind of massings of what that is and what, what a design could be for that, just to really begin to have a discussion with them. And what ensued was that the community sort of came on board and started still talking a lot about parking, but being less concerned about the density and more concerned about the aspirational side of how do you live in here, how you create a model for sustainable living, and how is this integrated into a neighborhood in a way that it belongs. So here we see the project and sort of the higher density in the back, the idea that this is the streetscape, this is the project, and it really is a collage of buildings and, and higher elements, but it's very, very much paying attention to the street uh, uh, frontages. We had to go through the whole thing of the historic district and beginning to say what were elements of scale, as Maurice had mentioned, that are important, but not the overt kind of uh, uh, character of, of historical architecture, you know, that it really was more about how it meets the street. And then really bringing them through what that building was uh, within the scale of the overall neighborhood and then coming closer and then closer to the building itself and how those spaces perform within uh, that area. Um, and, and then even, they were really concerned about the ma materials, the material, the quality of those materials and how those spaces interacted with the tactile surfaces and what it meant. We talked a lot about some things like the poabic tiles and that bring color and, and all these other things. So that they were sort of really beginning to feel comfortable that it was a contemporary building but that they were participating in the process of, of what were the sort of preferences for, for the building and the materials. So in the end, uh, the project is called La Hoya Garden because uh, we made a big focus of creating a community room, which is sort of that, that blue section, you'll see it again, that they call the, the jewel, and that the building was really like a, a garden court uh, apartment that opens up into the street, and within that there was a jewel, and it was a garden. So it was a plaza, a garden plaza with a community room in the middle, and then how, how the retail activates the street but also participates into that, how the entrances are, and really the micro scaling of how life is led in that building. And then also making the building as possibly efficient as we could. One of the other interesting things is that the building is 65 acres per density, but it could have been denser if it had not been that parking was the Damocles sword that was keeping the density lower. So we, we couldn't do that. And actually, in addition to the parking that's here, we actually, they, the client actually bought another property to accommodate more parking. So here we see how the, 
the project is fitting in, in its context, you know, the existing buildings and, and buildings that create pockets, uh, the jewel in the middle, so it's really a larger space subdivided into two spaces, and, and how that really began to uh, heal the, the area, create different uh, uh, relationships and not having the parking in the front, and you know, all those other things that are really uh, New urbanism, right? You know, that sounds like a dirty word. Uh, Maurice, uh, I had the pleasure of working, uh, being with him when he chaired the New Urbanism jury after that. And then one of the great things was to really redefine, to go in there rather than complain about it, redefine uh, uh, the issues of, of uh, uh, social justice and the issues of scale and, and really engage that rather than complain about it. Um, and, and also a lot of attention in, in the building was just incredibly straightforward, and, but also how, how do you live a life? So the amenity space was really sort of a, a common kitchen, an area for health living. Uh, CHAS, which is a health organization in the district, actually helped work with how do you make a center for active design, you know, sorry, active design. The idea that we were talking earlier about stairs, you know, having lights and even music as, as they do in Paseo Verde. And, and really uh, thinking again about how do you live in such a building and all of the rendering does a bad view of showing it, you, you can be in this terrace and really take in the entire street, see all the way down to the Ford Innovation Center or Clark Park, and, and really have uh, a whole series of semi-public spaces here, or public spaces here at the plaza, but a semi-public area for the residents and retail. And I think this is about uh, the end of it. And then also saying that that common space uh, is really important to programming, which is one of the things that, that Abir sort of was referring to, that in that uh, flexible container that opens up into it uh, can, can be a health, I can't read them, but one of them was set as a, as a health clinic, the other one is sort of like a, 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 a cafe that is open during the day, almost like a third space that is a cafe and a library and, and you can work there, or it could be a, a, a block party, or it could be that it's rented for, for a quinceañera or any of such events. And that that's what this space is, you know. So here's a view. It's not A, B, Z, X, Y, C because they had this competition. So now the sign that's going to go there is going to say La Jolla Gardens. Uh, but again, the idea of creating this uh, building that even though a lot of people, few people will live there, but a lot of people can really participate and it's a gift to the street that, it cre that really nurtures sort of the social life of the neighborhood. And that's the case study. Um, Hi. <laughs> um, let's see here. Great. Hi, I'm Beth, or Elizabeth, but you can call me Beth, um, from Merge Architects in Boston. So psyched to be here, because uh, I'm working in Detroit, which is really, really, it's been fantastic. We've been at it for a few years. Um, it's been slow, uh, but currently we have kind of four projects. I think one of them is a little iffy, but I'm going to show it today anyway. It's on hold, maybe indefinitely. Um, so thanks for having me. So what I wanted to talk about today, um, we're a smallish practice in Boston. We're a little bit under 20, just to give a sense of the context. So I'm working in Boston. Most of our work is around that area, but we're really starting to branch out. We're doing a lot of work in Detroit. We are randomly doing um, some housing in, hopefully, in Northwest Arkansas, um, as well as Wyoming, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. So kind of a weird, so context is really big for us. And Boston is a really tricky town to work in. I won't talk too much about it because I'm here to talk about Detroit, but working in Detroit has been fantastic. The context is there, the historical context is there. It's not as dense, but it's there, and it's very much a part of the conversation and how we, think about contemporary interpretations of the heritage, the historical, is very much what I do and fight for almost every other day in Boston um, with our housing projects there. So jumping right in, um, again, we're in, we're in Boston, that's the big circle. Um, we've done a little bit of work in Central America, a little bit of work in China, and we're starting to move west in the US. So housing, I wanted to start really quickly, and I'm gonna watch, I know I get the five minute and then the one minute. Who tells me the five minute, one minute? Okay, hey, okay, I've also got my phone because I'm gonna try to tell myself. <laughs> um, 
So we are obsessed with typology in my office because that's how we often think and talk about these housing projects because we, are, we have to get into the super nuances of these housing projects and the details in terms of how we actually get them through um, the processes, the approval processes in Boston, what we're interested in, like we'll turn a bay window inside out so it's an exterior condition versus an interior and so on. So what I'm gonna show you today are our projects in New York. I'm gonna start with a really quick project, which is a house, which is odd, but just to show you how we set up this idea of the outside in to this middle scale housing. So townhouses, the house, a two family, a duplex and so on is what we're up to um, with, with regard to the work I'm showing you today. And so we're gonna look at courtyards, keyholes, and carriage homes, and a few other things. So at Merge, we are, and I'll talk about this in a minute, really interested in the social ecology and choreography of these places. We've heard a lot of that from just about everybody. We're doing this at, in terms of these projects at a very micro scale. Um, so Antonio, it was so cool to see that project because your interest in the social space of the courtyard is something we're doing at a much tinier scale within the unit. So it all started with this house, um, which is only 2,000 square feet. It's two stories. We tore down this old cape. The whole charge was to create um, a house that had these incredible windows to this incredible garden that the, the client had fostered over the years. And so it just evolved into an idea about bringing the landscape into the house literally with these five courtyards that pierce the second floor. So it rains and snows in the middle, you know, in between your bedroom, your bathroom, and your bedroom, and your son's bedroom, and the kitchen, and so on. And then there's one that carves into the main level, living level of the house, which is in the center and in the surround. So it's like an island within the home. And so this was a really important project for us, even though it was tiny, um, because of how it actually brought in the landscape and really locked it into the site. So I don't wanna stay on this because it's not my Detroit project, but just to give you a sense of what we have been interested in and frankly, what we brought, I brought to the interview with, um, Bedrock when we first were introduced to the projects in Detroit, which was the Brush Park project. And so I talked a lot about the social ecology and the way that these spaces interact with these exterior spaces, which curiously provide a sense of separation and privacy between spaces, as well as transparency and unity within. So you operate in these kinds of homes very differently than you would without it. And so that seemed to resonate with the, those in the room at that time. And one thing led to another, and I'll just flip through these. Um, we ended up getting our first projects in Detroit were the Brush Park, two of the Brush Park typologies, um, which I'm gonna jump right to. And so we um, ended up doing the carriage homes and duplexes. It's so cool what they did. What they did is they obviously owned all these or bought all these lots. They didn't want the same architect doing all of them because they would look like the same architect doing all of them. It was also a ton of work for anybody. Um, and so they wanted a West Coast, East Coast, Midwest, and local architecture firm. So we got the East Coast piece, which was great, and then we had these amazing 80-person um, schematic meetings with microphones and so on throughout the whole uh, design process. And so this was our site um, before construction began. It was more pastoral, the occasional amazing um, but dilapidated uh, heritage homes, the historical mansions, which they've now been restoring one by one. Um, and then a really curious, I know Maurice showed this uh, image earlier, which is such a great image, um, that what they did is they of course have the streets that were existing before, but then they created these new streets in between. So the, in, the new streets in between, which are kind of like alleys, became the frontage for this new typology for Detroit, which is called the carriage homes. So they essentially, by code look like townhomes, but they have garages and entries on the alleyway. So how do you deal with that as a typology? Also, how do you actually um, enliven the center of the block that doesn't have the street frontage? The other, and those are those white buildings right there. That was our scope. Um, and there is another run of them back there. Those are the carriage homes. They're about 60 units. And then the front are a duplex, which, it's not a big deal for most of us, but there aren't any, I don't think there are any duplexes in, um, in Detroit, and they call them duplets, which I've never really understood. <laughs> Maurice might know. So we call them duplets. So along um, Edmond Street were a series of duplexes, um, or at least this scale of duplex hasn't been seen 
um, as a new project in Detroit in a while. So in plan, this is our scope, duplexes at the top, carriage homes within the block. And then, oh, let me go back. What's, what's called the, the Muse, which was, I can just stay here, such a really brilliant idea, which is a cross-grain green path that pierces through the duplexes, the carriage homes. And then the other typologies um, are corner, big corner office uh, apartment buildings being done by, done by Lorcan O'Hurley out of LA. And then um, a series of townhomes, more traditional townhomes in terms of their scale and frontage by Studio Dwell in Chicago. And HAA is the firm that's been working on the landscape, the master plan, and some of the buildings out of Detroit. And so that was our scope. It's ongoing. The carriage homes are under construction. But what was really interesting to us um, and what we talked quite a bit about was how do we create um, a green space and bring the exterior within the units themselves. So, and convince the developer of actually carving out a void space, and I'll, I'll zoom into these, between each pair of carriage homes, in this case, to create these courtyards. So we're giving up usable, in terms of interior, usable square footage, sellable square footage, but creating a much better experience um, and space to live in. And then what was really exciting was when we were awarded the duplex um, uh, block. That was a way for us to try to incorporate some exterior space that was more communal on the back of the duplexes into um, the system and fabric of these carriage homes, which is ringed in parking lots. So what we were given were kind of block plans with a sea of parking between them. So we were really trying to knit the exterior within the interior and create this new typology of um, the courtyard unit and pairings that nest for Detroit. And so here's the scope of the carriage homes, um, and here's a view. And so what was really um, challenging for us was how to think about this new frontage of the alley and create this kind of social space in this very tight corridor uh, between the, in this case, the two blocks. So we have six blocks of nine to 11 units, um, and these are essentially the fronts. So you drive into a garage, your front door is here, right next to your paired unit that shares the courtyard. And then we have balconies and different degrees of setbacks above. So creating this really great exterior social spe space between them on the second floor, um, as well as the roof, which I'll show in a minute, was something we were really pushing hard for. And so we did this material exploration of brick and metal and wood and really trying to bring it into the context of the brick of the heritage homes and how to think about this contemporary language. We had these huge um, design sessions with the other architects so that we were, I wouldn't say we're sharing a palette, but we were all trying to kind of differentiate each project, but yet keep it within this kind of um, general uh, palette of materials. And this is the back, the back that actually faces the um, back of the duplexes that has a gardenscape, which I'll show in a minute. And so just to zoom in on one of the blocks, you can see this is a really interesting condition where each of the paired units shares a courtyard, but only one unit owns it. These are for sale. These are not affordable units. The project at large um, had actually uh, uh, spread the affordable units out to um, some of the other projects throughout the site. So the carriage homes did our market rate. But the idea was that there was a shared courtyard so that both units um, benefited from the shared light from the courtyard, but only one unit had access. And then the other unit has a series of translucent windows into this courtyard space. So it's kind of a curious, five minutes. <laughs> it's kind of a curious um, condition between the two <laughs> units where they feel like there's a kind of mini community within the community of the block, within the community of the super block. And just to zoom into that, and I'll go quickly and how these pairs worked with the courtyard and then how they were deployed as these blocks of nine or 11 units. Um, and then in terms of form, we really looked at these um, roofscapes and how we could undulate back and forth with these uh, roof decks so that everyone has a sense of privacy on the roof. Um, everyone, uh, every unit that is of a particular size, so two of the three types, um, uh, have these exterior spaces and it's really great because when you're on the roof there is this um, wonderful uh, kind of patterning of exterior space, the courtyard space, um, and this um, undulating um, crisscross of these social spaces between the units, just a section, and then how this courtyard plays out within these very tight, very narrow, otherwise very dark in the center um, unit types. 
and the relationship of the interior. That's one of the courtyards to the left, um, next to the kitchen and next to the living space. And then the roofscape, this is again one of six um, blocks. And the uh, kind of material and formal language um, of those spaces. Um, the roofscape became very important because it really very much is a fifth facade for the larger corner apartment buildings because they're much taller. And they look down and they're very close to our project. So, and they also have these more extended communal decks off of them. So when it's all said and done, I think there's going to be like a very lively social um, datum <laughs> that's three stories above grade. We hope. And it's under construction. They're building it. It's ongoing. They've um, finished almost two blocks out of the six. The interior uh, is really fantastic because it um, is a kind of cascading of these sectional um, spaces that then align with this courtyard in the middle of each unit, or I'm sorry, between each of the two units. The duplex was this ambitious idea about how we could, and again, this is the scope, um, filter in the public through the block. So what we did is we devised a series of keyholes between um, certain cl uh, uh, clusters of these unit types. And that would be a way to actually filter through the block, which became not only just an entrance, a side entrance, which became front entrances for many of these units, but actually was a, th a through fare um, into the parking area in the green space where the carriage homes are. So there are a series of those. and. There are two different types. There's the banded and the stacked. Each, the stacked run uh, east-west, the banded, the banded units run north-south, and we did this kind of mashup of the two types. And so there's this whole series of, um, and I'll show you kind of how we were thinking through the, the east-west. Somebody had mentioned earlier today this idea about the stair. This was very much a part of the project. These are entry stairs that are transparent. They're, um, uh, perforated metal, so they're uh, exterior spaces, but contained and have a locked gate. But they create this porosity through the block into the center of the block for these entry, entry um, sequences. And then on the back, there is what we, what we were asked to do was to create a carport for the parking. So that became our second level um, communal garden space that then connected with the carriage homes behind it. How am I doing on time? Like two minutes? OK. So this was the banded unit, which I'll, I'll race through, which is just a slightly different typology. And then this is where we were in an early schematic. And I wanted to show this, because this had the, we're in our third iteration of this project. Um, and we're finally, finally just starting, hopefully, to build it in January. Um, it's changed quite a bit. It's, it's gotten smaller. But the idea was that we were borrowing from these different materials throughout the entire project at large, um, as well as the heritage homes, and creating this kind of playful building block um, assembly of these duplex units, which would represent the two-story house um, stacked. And that was the um, landscape on top of the carport and some of the plans with those keyhole spaces. Pullman Park is a project that is um, near the Lafayette West Park that we're working on. And again, another interesting um, courtyard typology. At this time, we're in the center of a block again. I think we're getting like branded um, in this particular city for this kind of housing, which is carriage homes, um, which we haven't done in Boston before. What's ringing it are a series of townhomes from Studio Dwell, the architect that worked on the townhomes at Brush Park. And so we're within the block again. We have the same challenges. How do we bring people, vehicles, and so on into the block and create this coveted condition within an otherwise maybe forgotten zone of the super block? And so it's a little different. It's, it's kind of a donut with a large um, traditional courtyard in the center. The corner buildings are the townhouse um, uh, project. They're not ours, but we're in between them. And so again, we brought the courtyard um, typology of the paired unit. Uh, and then arrayed it in this um, circular plan around the, the greater courtyard. And then the uh, alleyway is actually, in this case, the vehicular access to the garages that are in the back. And the frontage is both back and front. Just looking at that in aggregation. Similar idea of the courtyard, looking at building form and these undulating roof, um, roof decks and roof terraces, and then really looking at this contemporary interpretation of the shed roof 
um, and creating this sense of the uh, more of the, of the house, domestic scale of the house, um, throughout these bands of the carriage homes. And then lastly, I'll just show you um, a townhouse. So this is not a carriage home, but we're working with, on a site that's uh, right across from Mises um, townhomes in Lafayette Park called Lafayette West. This is the project that's on hold. Um, and so it's really intimidating to build next to time. It's really intimidating to build next to Mies. Um, and so what we looked at was this kind of um, relentless grid, beautiful but relentless grid, and how we could reconceptualize that by kind of taking out a square. God forbid, he's rolling over. Um, and what that, and, and also our interest in um, kind of identity of unit. And so what we ended up with was sort of a jumble of the grid that created these really wonderful relationships and kind of a ambiguity of the edges of the townhome. We were interested in how we could um, kind of craft and weave together a series of townhomes that di wasn't so clear where the party wall was. And so that was our, our um, kind of direction for this project, which then created all these really wonderful outdoor terraces and again, these recessed roof um, spaces that create this sort of puzzled effect um, with this townhouse type. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry I went over. I think you gotta, I had one oh more. So I'm, I'm trying to get to yours. Sure. I have a PDF anyway. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank Laura. you. Okay. So, how am I going to do this? Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to start with um, without um, my slideshow real quick. Uh, do, do you know how to do this again? I don't. Sorry. I'm, I don't know how to work with a PC. Um, I'm a little bit out of the loop here with my uh, PDF. Um, uh, Thank you uh, for, for the invitation and uh, um, the opportunity to talk a little bit with two hats. And uh, you know, I'm, uh, as you probably have uh, uh, heard many times today, I'm the uh, coordinator of the system studio, the housing research studio with the collaboration uh, with uh, Maurice Cox and the city of Detroit for the last four years. And now uh, another couple of years, uh, we had enormous amount of research work done, uh, several hundred projects now in various different uh, sites in the, in the city. And uh, while we were doing this uh, work with the students, we in our office uh, at Volume 1 had the great opportunity more and more to work uh, in, on housing projects in Detroit as well. So the, the question always came up, you know, uh, what constitutes housing, what is the most important aspect of housing, uh, to create a sustainable housing uh, project. And sustainable uh, for me at this moment is um, sustainable in terms of so social sustainability. Uh, social sustainability is the uh, question of how to keep people uh, in the place, in the, in the dwelling uh, and identify with, uh, with the place they live. Uh, we see uh, in housing projects, especially uh, from, as an observer from uh, outside, as a, as a German citizen living in the United States, as, as a sort of a strange relationship uh, to rental housing, a, a fairly uh, neglected uh, typology. And we think, uh, especially coming from Berlin, cities uh, like that, where housing can be extremely expensive, um, Rental housing is extremely important for a city, but rental housing needs to be accepted as a high quality housing typology in the city. So we had uh, 2015 um, the, the opportunity to start the first larger site in the city, which is um, about a five acre site. It was a, a competition conducted uh, through the DSO, the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, uh, owned properties to be developed. And we found, uh, or we worked together with a fantastic developer at that time, which actually embraced our innovativeness and different approach to housing. 
um, and to developing an urban block. Uh, the, the site was large enough, enough and had critical mass, um, which allowed us to integrate many different programs into the site, which was uh, somewhat demanded, somewhat uh, was uh, suggested by the urban opportunity which we were given. Um, we mixed housing with a hotel, we mixed housing with the University of Michigan Center, which was planned to be uh, located there. Um, a lot of artists and musicians from the DSO were supposed to be housed there, and additional artist studio and opportunities and galleries were supposed to be implemented. But we also had to deal with a massive and ugly parking garage uh, on site, which then we took as an advantage uh, to add on to in order to tuck cars away as much as possible. And you see the, the entrance to the original uh, old garage, which we cladded with some decoration on one side, but a liner building uh, towards, uh, towards a new entrance plaza to the, the inner courtyards, where um, we could house a micro units, artist, and a gallery um, uh, along with it. Uh, the hotel is in the front here with some retail in the, in the bottom. The, the biggest question is, was, however, what kind of building typologies and what kind of locations could we generate in order to produce situations to create as many different typologies as possible? Uh, large family-oriented units, small live-work units, uh, studios, affordable housing, a complete mixed bag of an urban condition. So, the, the driving force was definitely the sequence of uh, inner courtyards which created a porous and uh, permeable block within the city or within this entire block which would invite people to certain programs but then also create other conditions of higher uh, priority for residences and uh, privacy or to signify uh, private life and to keep people up, more or less out. So the Devonport Court in the bottom, for instance, in a very small residential street, we allowed um, uh, first floor uh, uh, maisonette units for live-work situations possibly and signified with a fairly tight space and no retail that this is a private uh, location, whereas we have the northern part which opens up to the Cass Corridor and other venues uh, north of the, um, of, of the site, uh, that this is a more public space. Uh, here we see the passage through from the further, um, you know, rather private area to the more public area, and uh, we heard this morning that things like bridges and stairs will be extremely important, which we have then also integrated into into this, um, into this project. Uh, connections to the parking deck, which was lined and invisible, and so forth. Um, what we have learned from that project, uh, we were able then to um, apply uh, really rigorously, but also in a certain amount of experimentation to the last largest city-owned land in the city of Detroit, a seven-acre land, and we somewhat calculated that a, um, a density of 50 units per acre would be what, what this, uh, this piece of land would hold. Uh, the land was vacated. It was um, uh, occupied for the longest time as a sports field. The roads were taken out, which were there before. You see here the uh, pre previous uh, urban aspect uh, or ur urban uh, layout of small single-family houses, a large school in the top left which is still standing, but the rest was basically raised. And the premise of the city was to reinstate the street grid, at least in the north-south fashion, that 4th Street would continue again, that the neighborhood of Midtown, uh, which, would sur uh, which uh, s surrounds this last piece of property in the city would actually be integrated. We loved that idea, of course, to create a certain integration that there was uh, government support uh, from the planning department to actually not create an island situation of a developer-driven uh, single uh, character, uh, you know, almost gated community. We, we really loved the idea to now experiment of how 
a series of uh, courtyards, public and private spaces, or semi-private spaces, would contribute to the overall neighborhood and connect the city uh, with various different means. Uh, vehicular traffic, of course, uh, pedestrian traffic, pedestrian-only uh, traffic, uh, but also the implement implementation of several plazas was really important. Because we think there's a certain amount of publicity necessary in the city, as well as a certain amount of privacy. Um, we always look at buildings and translucency or transparency and permeability, but um, at the end of the day, when you're coming home, you want to be at home. You don't want to live on the street. Uh, you want to have an uh, area of repose, but then a certain level of interaction within the city. So you should have a choice. Um, so this taught us that urban design is actually the basis of, of housing, not even looking, and I don't go into the unit uh, typologies, because at this time it was, was not very important. This is an urban design project which we took to guarantee that certain qualities of life would actually be uh, provided. So uh, regardless of the unit types, I think, um, and this is, the basis of the talk is that the urban design can guarantee a really good place, uh, a sustainable urban environment where people can identify with, want to stay for a longer period of time and take care of their neighborhood, and also really embrace you know, the life and activate the, uh, the space uh, in, in their neighborhood. So for instance, we have two distinctly different places originally envisioned, it has now changed slightly, but. Uh, the, the absolute idea was to have a, um, a public plaza for public activity for the entire neighborhood beyond uh, this development, far beyond this development, and a private plaza is this one here, the Tuscola Plaza, which is very much only for the people who live here, but in, a public, in the public realm. Uh, a safe place, you know, you talk always about the idea that uh, you know we have the eyes on the street. This was, in all aspects, extremely important for us. Um, we have the eyes on the street, the people also populate the street. But on the other hand, then, we created uh, areas of repose, private or semi-private, residence-only courtyards uh, for all of the buildings uh, as much as we could. Um, Another thing which was quite important is the Muse, which we introduced here, a non-vehicular traffic or non-motorized traffic space, which allowed now completely different types of, uh, or typologies of housing. So the, the framework of the urban design was important for this in order to guarantee that other architects eventually would create uh, and embrace this, as these, these different urban situations. Uh, we envisioned here on the right-hand side, for instance, uh, two-story uh, live-work uh, units, for instance. Um, the Muse would be in, uh, entered in the far left from the Tuscola Plaza here, a network of uh, continuous um, pedestrian uh, connections throughout the neighborhood and leading out to other places which uh, are existing beyond this, this area. Um, the, the architecture, which is uh, here more or less a placeholder, just should signify a certain amount of you know, solidity and urbanism but, uh, or, and character, but it was not really meant to be uh, taken, taken literal. And we deliberately, we also learned from um, Brush Park, from City Modern, that a uh, situation where we would invite as many architects as possible for each of these buildings uh, would create this uh, diversity and richness which is necessary so that not only one architect would work on it. And lastly, one of the most important things, I think, in order to create a density of 50 uh, units per, uh, per acre was um, an implementation of a parking scheme. Um, we do not love parking. Uh, we. Uh, do not like to talk about parking, but also we do not like to see parking. Uh, so we spent a lot of time on parking uh, in result and created certain uh, uh, situations where parking became a positive uh, facilitator for privacy. Um, in Detroit, parking is required. This area had a relief already of point to, to allow 0.75 cars per unit. 
which is uh, a very great help to do a development and to achieve that density. Uh, but street parking was not uh, be able to be counted. So we, need to, we needed to uh, allow sheltered parking and created raised courtyards where the cars would be half in the ground and would allow now a courtyard, a semi-private courtyard, to be elevated five feet off the street, which also uh, guaranteed that we could, in most cases, have uh, residential units on the ground floor five feet above street level for safety and privacy. You see here an entrance uh, to, the, to the parking, the underground parking, which is daylit from above with various different perforations. Detroit has a very strange relationship to parking. Uh, in comparison to other cities, underground parking is basically not existing uh, due to the high cost of ventilation and construction and so forth. So our very cost effective and multi-purpose solution really created ventilated parking, it was very cost effective, it was sheltered parking, and we could use the space, we could double use the space for private courtyards in a very positive way. Most of these sites have um, uh, ex uh, had to be excavated anyway, uh, brownfield sites and so forth, you know, old rubble, old demolished buildings in the ground, so th uh, we, we have to deal with excavation anyhow, so we use that as a p positive uh, aspect to, to uh, secure these, uh, these conditions. So at the end of the day, parking became an interesting driver for quality, uh, whereas oftentimes in Detroit, parking uh, dominates the sites in such a way that it renders the outdoors uh, uh, completely unusable and creates residual spaces throughout the town and fragments neighborhoods uh, quite dramatically. And in this case, we uh, turned everything around and we hope that the urban design aspect of this, uh, of this work really contributed to not only social sustainability, but also certain quality uh, of life, which allowed uh, residents to, uh, to really identify with it. So this project is now underway. Uh, we're starting with the first building um, uh, in the fall, and uh, we have another number of architects, including Daniel Liebeskin Studio in New York, to, to take, off, uh, take on other, other aspects of this site, and this would be ongoing for the next couple, couple of years. Thank you very much.